Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jakob Hanke Vela. I'm a trade reporter. I cover um, trade agreements and uh, trade negotiations for uh, Politico in Brussels. And I would like to uh, welcome you to a new uh, interview session um, with Marie Claude Bibot, uh, Minister of Agriculture and Agri Food uh, in Canada. Um, Minister uh, Bibot, thank you so much for being here with us. It's a pleasure to uh, to have you uh, for our uh, Agri and Food Summit. Um, I would uh, like to uh, start right away um, with uh, COVID um, because you have been at the uh, in the center of uh, reacting to the COVID crisis, um, making sure that the uh, food supply chain works, which I suppose, especially in the beginning, uh, was uh, not evident. Um, with uh, people rushing to supermarkets um, and uh, supply chains breaking down internationally. Um, what is your main takeaway from these past months um, as, as a Minister for Agriculture? Bonjour, Jacob. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today from Canada. Uh, yes, obviously, the COVID crisis has been uh, as difficult uh, in Canada. Uh, we've seen this panic movement. Uh, but one thing that I was uh, worrying about a lot was our international food supply chain. But actually, it did uh, work uh, pretty well uh, in this regard. The biggest challenge that we had to deal with uh, was related to the closure of the restaurants and institutions. So obvi obviously, um, big drops in the demand for our producers and processors. And labor was a major, major issue. First, uh, we had to find ways to bring our uh, foreign temporary workers in our um, in our in the field, in our farms, and our food processing uh, facilities. Uh, even though our borders were closed for uh, non-essential travel, but I can tell you that food workers are definitely essential workers, and this was a very challenging exercise. But uh, we made it through in a well, a good good way. Um, we could always take more, but uh, considering the circumstances, uh, uh, we found uh, solutions. And the other important issue was also uh, related to labor because we had some outbreaks in um, some processing facilities, for example. So we could see, um, let's say, the weaknesses, the strength, definitely, of our food supply chain because. Uh, our Canadian food supply chain has been extremely uh, resilient and impressive through the crisis, but still, we could uh, we were able to identify weaknesses around um, the this uh, the fact that um, in terms of processing in some sector we rely on few processors, uh, while we have so many small fa family farms all across the country. So this is something that we will have to look at. To, um, so what you're saying is you would uh, like to have more uh, diversity in the food processors. Um, is that correct? Yes, actually, um, I think Canadians and people in, in different countries have realized how important the work of their farmers is, and they are looking at supporting more their local farmers. Uh, in the same way, we all know when we work in this business how it's important also to uh, have strong international and regional food supply chain. And uh, this is the idea. We, we want to be competitive on a global scale. So this is why sometimes in some sector we rely on, on few big ones. But in the same time, we have to find the right balance to um, mm -hmm. be more, um, you know, flexible and uh, resilient. So that would be uh, the trend of moving more to um, having uh, farmers uh, processing their own food um, and selling sort of uh, upscale products, not just uh, sort of the, the, the commodities. Well, this is always a matter of finding the right balance. Canada will remain a big right. producer, food producer and exporter, and uh, we have to be competitive on the global stage. Uh, but in the same time, we have to make sure that we do not rely on only a few uh, processors right. to, um, to protect our family farms all across the country. 
Can you tell us how you want to uh, make sure that you will have uh, more than just a few processors? Will, I, are we talking about um, antitrust uh, or uh, is it or more sort of uh, encouraging um, more new producers to uh, enter the market? Well, I think uh, at the end of the day, it's going to be the businesses who will decide, uh, you know, where it goes. Yeah. But uh, and in Canada, you know that it's a federation. And uh, when it comes to um, local initiatives, regional initiatives, it relies more on the province's uh, responsibilities. So we will work together, uh, as we have done in a very significant way uh, during the last six months, and, uh, and we always do. But still, I, I think it's just at this moment, it's, uh, and your question was, uh, what are my takeaways? We have to look at it, but I don't have the solutions right now. Right. Okay. Um, I would uh, like to, since we were already speaking about supply chains um, and international supply chains, um, there is a counter movement against um, importing food from everywhere in the world. People want to buy more local food. Um, and one of the ways this, this uh, sort of movement uh, materializes is in protest against trade agreements. Um, I know that uh, CETA uh, has been under attack in the EU, but it's also uh, been criticized in Canada, I think. Um, and I think there has been criticism from farmers coming. Um, do you think uh, CETA uh, will sort of survive these these, these um ongoing uh, attacks, criticism, um, are there, is the deal actually delivering? Um, and do you think this will ever end? Will, or or will, we, will this be an ongoing debate um, and, and uh, people will always question this trade agreement? Um, maybe people will always question, but I strongly believe that these free trade agreements are essential to ensure uh, food security uh, everywhere in the world. Uh, there's only a few countries who maybe can believe if, uh, that, that, that they can be fully uh, self-sufficient, but their population would have to adapt to a different way of living and different choices. Um, I think it, it, there's definitely a will and uh, you know, from the, the, the citizens to encourage more their local producers and to um, see them um, adapt, adopt the best uh, sustainable practices. And it is possible. And we are doing that. Uh, our farmers, and I can tell you that Canadian farmers really care for, their envi for the environment, for their land and for their animals. And uh, we are investing a lot in research, so we want uh, to help them adopt this, these, these best practices mm -hmm. and have access to these new technologies. So there's definitely a movement you know, from uh, our farmers to, to respond to the expectations of the, of the consumers. But in the same time, I don't think it's realistic. And uh, we will be all better served if we work together, if we make sure we have predictable, this is so essential for our farmers, have predictable mm -hmm. uh, rules and that everybody, you know, follow the rules based on science. It's, uh, and I think with Europe, uh, we are very like-minded in this regard and we have to keep advocating for rule-based and science-based uh, free trade agreement. Okay. Um can you say anything about uh, the criticism from uh, the Canadian side? Um, I think the, the farmers are worried that they are not uh, able to fill all the tariff rate quotas that the EU promised them. Um, you mentioned science-based, how important it is to have science-based uh, uh, criteria. Um, it, do I hear an implicit criticism that maybe uh, what the EU does is not always science-based, uh, or is that just my uh, interpretation? Um, I mean, that, that's definitely a, a criticism coming from other countries um, and from Canada as well, I think, at the WTO. Um, do you think that's what's making it so difficult to fill these tariff rate quotas? Um, I, well... Definitely Canada and EU are, are good uh, trading partners and we, we will always have some challenges. Uh, but, uh, you know, in Canada, we are a big country with uh, a big territory and a small population. 
Um, and our biggest strength is definitely the quality of our producers and the fact that we have a very uh, reliable safety um, system, uh, uh, inspection system. So we, mm -hmm. you can be sure that when you get Canadian producers, uh, they are safe for, for your population. And uh, we have to keep advocating for science-based and rule-based rule uh, trade because this is what we believe in and this is what is our biggest strength. Uh, it's not the size of our economy who is giving us uh, any kind of power. Uh, so it's really the fact that we have good quality and we are a reliable partner. Uh, when it comes to the EU, I would say... Um, uh, in many ways, we are like-minded in many, many ways. Um, and um, I would make the difference between, or, uh, hmm, sorry, sometimes it's challenging to come in uh, with some nuance uh, in, in our second language, but, right. um, you know, science-based, uh, I, I think the responsibility of the state is to ensure that uh, the safety of the food that is right. on the shelves in the grocery stores, and that um, meeting consumers' expectations is the responsibility of the industry. So I would just um, be careful uh, using some um, clients' uh, expectation as uh, mm -hmm. non-tariff barriers, let's say. Uh, and I hope okay. that my that what I want to say is not lost in translation, <laughs> but... Uh, so this is maybe a little uh, worry that we have, but because definitely we would like to uh, see Canada benefit as much as the EU from uh, from CETA, um, which is not the case. Yet. And you mentioned, <laughs> um, so you, so you, so you're saying that uh, the EU is actually benefiting more from CETA at the moment. Yes, definitely. Um, so we are having uh, discussions on different fronts to uh, to try to clarify the situation. But we expect, uh, you know, that uh, at the end of the day, we will make decisions based on science, evidence, and just you know making sure that the food that we're providing to our population is is safe and meet uh, the criteria. And I can assure you that Canada is very committed to fill it's uh, engage, engagement in, you know, in terms of quota, right. but also in terms of whatever quality that uh, uh, is, is needed to, uh, to fill the requirements. Can you give a few examples on uh, how um, the EU is benefiting at the moment, um, maybe more from CETA than Canada? Um, so I think we, we talked about the tariff rate quotas. Um, are, there, are there certain products where this is more uh, obvious? But it's, it's not necessarily the same products, obviously, which are entering it and going in into mm -hmm. direction, obviously. Um, and uh, I'll start with the, uh, the dairy products, the, the, the teas, for okay. example. It is obviously something that is uh, very difficult for our Canadian dairy farmers. Um, you know, the, the, the average dairy farm in Canada is 80, uh, with 80 cows. They are uh -huh. family farms and they rely heavily on this um, supply management system that has been put in place 50 years ago. So our farms have developed uh, this way. And then our cheese factory maybe accept three big one across the country we have plenty hundreds of tiny um hand handcraft uh cheese factory mm -hmm. uh with 60 or 80 cows uh, many are organic uh so it's um and and we are you know all the quota in terms of cheese uh are filled so we do respect our agreement, but I can tell you that it hurts mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit on this side of the ocean. Um, mm -hmm. And we have uh, some challenges, you know, exporting our um, during wheat in Italy or uh, some challenges around uh, beef. Uh, but it's been very good for uh, canola, for biofuels. So they're right there. And, and uh, frozen lobster, for example, and cranberries. So we have some some wins, uh, but the overall, uh, we would like it, we would like to see it more balanced. Okay, I'm going to ask you one last um, 
uh, sort of critical question about CETA. Do you think uh, that uh, it was unfair from the EU to uh, grant the US uh, access for its lobsters um, last month um, when Canada had to uh, negotiate an, an entire trade agreement to get access for its lobsters to the EU market? And the EU um, now um, basically gave Trump this as a little uh, present. Um, or do you understand that why they did it? And will this actually hurt uh, Canadian exports? Um, well, it's definitely opening the door to an important market. Um, but it's hard yeah. to take, you know, one specific items um, out of a, a greater context. Okay. Um, let me move to the next topic because I think um, uh, we, we, we don't have so much time uh, left. Um, uh, I would like to talk a bit about the WTO uh, reform um, um, before taking a few questions from, from the public as well because uh, people are, are, are asking a lot of questions. Um, uh, do you do you think uh, that there will be a soon uh, a, a reform? I think Canada and the EU obviously have uh, have worked very closely together on on reforming the WTO. Um, and but do you think uh, it will be possible to uh, keep the the reform only to industrial subsidies, as uh, the EU and the US and uh, most developed countries want, or do you think there will also be necessarily a talk about uh, subsidies for agriculture? Well, I think it's important that um, we join forces and that we make sure that the WTO is, is strong and uh, function well. Uh, bilateral agreements are definitely important, um, but uh, at the end of the day, we need these bilateral uh, strong body uh, to make sure that um, we have some global standards and that uh, we um, we can together um, work for them how can, should, make sure that these agreements are working in, for the for the benefit of everyone and once again I will keep repeating you know uh, based on science and, and, and rules. And it's very important right. that the WTO being very strong. And this is why we uh, have launched the Canada Group to, um, to work even, you know, to be uh, proactive on, on this issue. Right. Um, and in, in, this, in, in this reform, uh, you know, there, there are uh, big agriculture countries, um, especially developing countries, um, in India, for example, but also um, big agriculture powerhouses in South America who say that if we change the WTO rules, if we update the WTO, we should also talk about agriculture, um, especially how um, rich countries are subsidizing their um, farmers, um, and especially in the EU. Do you think they have a point? I think it's interesting to to have this discussion um, because, uh, well, it's it's an issue even when Canada compares the type of support we can afford to give our farmers to the level of support that they get in other countries. Um, so, uh, yes, it's definitely something interesting to uh, to follow up on. And this is why I'm working closely with my colleague, Minister Mary Ng, who is our Minister for International Trade. Uh, on, you know, seeing what we can do to have um, the WTO working, uh, working well for the benefit of uh, the greater number of countries. And uh, um, last question, because I, before I move to the um, to questions from the audience, uh, do you think this could become a trade-off that um, uh, developing countries say, okay, we can talk about um, stricter rules on subsidies for industry, but in exchange, we should also um, put some uh, limits, uh, stricter limits on subsidies for agriculture. Do you think that this will become a quid pro quo? Well, um, I think I would prefer not to go into so much details in the sense okay. that, you know, right. it always have to look to be looked at in, 
in its context. And yeah. um, so I'll, um, Minister Ng uh, from uh, Canada's uh, side is the leader on this issue. And uh, I mean, this, it's a complicated file and we have to look at the different uh, elements uh, together to, to come to a, a balance, once again, a balanced position at the end of the day. And fair. Okay. <laughs> Um, I got uh, one question from the audience, which is asking, um, is there in Canada also a system of direct payments uh, to farmers? So the, the sort of subsidies that the EU gives, is, is, is there a similar system in Canada? Uh, no, our, what we have is uh, uh, business risk management programs, uh, which is kind of an insurance program. Uh, actually, there are four. Uh, one will help farmers when they face a very significant loss in their revenues. And I can assure you, uh, and they are complaining a lot because uh, they have to have lost at least 70% of, of their revenues to just apply to, to be able to receive a, a portion of the extra loss less than, you know, behind, below the 70% uh, threshold. Another one would support them when they have to face extraordinary costs. Uh, for example, after uh, a tornado or, you know, something uh, mm -hmm. major in a region or a drought in a region. Uh, another one would support when they are losing significantly uh, a, a crop. So these are the types of, of programs. So it's more similar to an insurance uh, program that the, 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 the government is contributing to, uh, but there is no direct subsidy to farmers. Uh, at the federal level, we have three main responsibilities, which are to support them uh, on um, international trade, investing in sci science and innovation, and you know this business risk management and other um, similar investment program, but no direct payment. Okay. Um, I got one uh, last question from the audience um, um, before we end. Um, if, if, you, if you have one more uh, minute, which would be, um, how worried are you about the African swine uh, fever in Europe? Um, and are you monitoring this closely? Of course, uh, we do worry. Uh, it would be... Um, it would be uh, uh, very um, harmful for our producers, uh, pork producer. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are working hard on, on putting, you know, as much uh, precautionary measures to at the border, uh, working closely with the United States and Mexico to avoid having the African swine fever on our territory, on our continent, uh, sharing best practices with the other countries around the world. We have signed an agreement with the uh, with EU actually and with uh, USA. You know, if it happened in Canada, we could um, there's a zoning agreement, so we could divide the country um, following very strict norm eventually. So we are trying to see how best we can avoid this, mm -hmm. um, but it's very worrying. Okay. Um, on, on, on that uh, note, um, I have to um, end, end the interview. Um, thank you so much for, for, for your time. Uh, this was really interesting. Um, and I hope we can uh, do this again um, and maybe uh, next time in person when the pandemic is over. I can't wait. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Take thank care. Thank you. You too.